Okay, I think we can start. Hi everybody, this is another session of our PhD seminars. Today, uh, Luca and Francesco will present us uh, the world of types. So if you need to understand if your program is sound somehow, then you are in the right place. So I leave the work to both of you. Hi, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a very ambitious presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say this is more uh, like uh, there are some things I heard about in uh, talks in conferences in schools, and uh, we talk, uh, me and Francesco, about these things, and we think they're interesting, so we, we try to to write down some kind of presentation to, to these things. The title is stolen from a PhD school we did not even attend, <laughs> and, but the title was cool, so we, we thought it was nice. Uh, so first of all, if you if you like uh, type system and statically statically typed languages, probably at some point in your developer uh, lives you you wonder what happened with languages, uh, why we ended up using uh, PHP and JavaScript and Python the whole day. And uh, so, if you think if you think like that, uh, you you can say there are a lot of guarantees I can get from type system, a lot of uh, early error detection, uh, some uh, a lot of research about type system and nice tools uh, I can apply. For instance, the the editor can suggest a lot of things and how to complete magically what I'm writing thanks to that. And uh, at some point in the last uh, two decades, at least. Uh, the software industry went like, yeah, that's a variable, that's a function, and I'm okay with that. There's nothing more I want to know. And uh, of course, uh, developers are not dumb, not more than ordinary people, so there must be a reason why why it ended up this way. And uh, it's some kind of religious war that keeps happening in the software industry. The usual arguments uh, you hear is uh, something along the lines of, uh, uh, static languages being more verbose uh, and asking you to write more uh, things that are apparently stupid, while dynamic languages uh, re requires you to write uh, to type less things and to write less types. Uh, static languages are somehow stricter and they they forbid you to do some things you would actually like to do, while you can do that in dynamic languages, including things. Uh, that are not correct, of course, but that's the price for the freedom. Or you, there are some arguments about the scalability. So usually you consider statically type languages uh, more scalable to big projects, and uh, languages like Python or JavaScript uh, better for rapid prototyping. You have an idea and uh, you want to do a prototype implementation in, in a few days of it. And uh, of course, there is some inertia. Like uh, I always do that. Uh, I know these languages. I'm not, I'm not really doing anything fancy with it, but I know it, and I keep doing it. Or everyone uses it. Uh, so I want I want my project to use that particular language as well. There is some truth in it, but of course, uh, every every one of these arguments is uh, very it's too simple, right? There. Uh, the real use case scenario are more complex. For instance, when you think about conciseness and verbosity, uh, if you have a very simple piece of code, like this is a function taking two objects, invoking some methods on them, collecting the results, and uh, returning returning them, it may feel like uh, writing types in this kind of code. It's uh, both boring and uh, not not very useful. This is a string, this is an integer, I want to return an integer, I give a type to my intermediate results, and there is not a, a huge gain in productivity in doing this. But after a while, so, so this is the dynamic version, this is the statically typed one. Uh, this is Kotlin because uh, it, uh, it allows me to write code with types and code with, without types, but this is just, it could work in, you could do that in any language you prefer. At some point, maybe you realize that uh, the function you're writing is part of your public API, so people are using it, and uh, maybe it is blah, blah, blah. At the beginning of a function is actually something computationally expensive, something that you only want to do uh, if you really need to. So you add some uh, checks at the beginning in your dynamically typed language, 
something very boilerplate, right? Like uh, if this is not a string, throw an exception now and don't do anything else, and things like this. Then since this is part of your public API, you want other people to be able to use it as well. So you have to document it a bit and uh, maybe use a Java doc or similar tools that produce automatically documentation starting from special comments. And you say, this argument uh, must be a string, this argument must be of type int, I want to return this, blah, blah, blah. And maybe your boss heard about unit testing and coverage, and so you have to write tons of uh, very fun unit tests, like uh, give it a null and see if it throws an open exception, give it a wrong type and see if it throws an exception, blah, blah, blah. So of course, uh, conciseness and verbosity and all the other aspects are, uh, are not really Absolute, but you have to, to consider the way you use uh, your language. Uh, yeah? Okay. Because one thing is to write types, and one thing is to use types. Yes, there, there is, yes there is the whole thing about type inference yeah. that, can, uh, that can make this, uh, this line more fuzzier. So, yes. Uh, of course, it depends on how complex your type system gets. Up to some point, you can let the compiler verify your types. After a while, it becomes harder and harder, but yes, that, that is true. Uh, or if you're in a dynamically typed language like Python, you, you can go with the Python way and use what they call duck typing. So, duck typing is the typing discipline of Python and possibly other languages. And, uh, it's called like that because it's based on the duck test. It's a form of abductive reasoning. It's, if it works like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then it must be a duck, which makes some sense. And in programming languages, what this means is that I don't really care about what this A object is. As long as I can call the method I need to call on it, I'm fine with it. I don't, I don't care about its type and, uh, and its structure. You can go quite far with it. Uh, there are a lot of uh, projects, um, most Python code, I think, just does that for the whole time. It works, uh, well, of course, it has its limitation. I mean, at some point while coding, you could find out that asking to shot, <laughs> a shot to a bartender or to a gun is may, may, be, may have different side effects, but it, it works for a while. Uh, So just to be politically correct, I have also to show a misuse of static typing. Uh, in, the, in the project we are currently working on, uh, we're implementing a language and we're writing a, a compiler for it. Uh, at, so, at some point, of course, I needed to, to, write, um, to write something to a file, which is, which is what most compilers do in the end. And I needed to write uh, an integer to the file. Uh, I didn't really know perfectly the library I was using, which is not nice, but it's often the case. And uh, I let the automatic suggestion guide me. Uh, writer dot write my integer variable. It compiled, it, uh, it took that, that type. So I thought it was doing what, uh, what I thought. Of course, I was wrong. Uh, weird things were shown in my file. Uh, they, the numbers I wanted to write were definitely not there. And so I, I did what we always do when we have a bug in our system. I tried to make it as simple as possible. So I make my compiler just write a seven on the file. And I failed at that as well. Uh, my file was empty. So I, I did something I should have done at the beginning, which is reading the documentation. And uh, the documentation says that this method actually takes a Unicode number and prints the corresponding character. Now, I don't know if there is any Unicode nerd here, but do you know what the number seven is in Unicode? Extremely useful bell character, which in the 80s is used to make your computer do something like that. <laughs> Needless to say, my laptop didn't do that, so my file was just empty. So, so I guess the, the message is that we, it's, we can very easily misuse uh, uh, both static and dynamic uh, type languages. And uh, there, is, there is an article on the web, it's a white paper, so it's not technical. It's, it's, very, it's from Chris Smith. It's a blog post, and it's called What to Know Before Debating Type System. And uh, he summarized these things in a much better way than I do. 
And uh, his conclusion was many programmers have used very poor statically typed languages, and many programmers have used dynamically typed languages very poorly. Uh, and that probably definitely ended up in these categories uh, at some point. And uh, it's an interesting read. If, uh, if you're interested in these things, uh, read it because it's not technical at all, it's not too long, and uh, it's free on the, on the internet. So, uh, of course, after all these, you have to choose whether you like, uh, whether you want to go with the dynamic uh, type side of the world. <laughs> Sorry, I like matrix. And, uh, and the, or the static type of the world, the dynamic one. And uh, now, suppose uh, we like the static type of the world that we want. A nice program with all these guarantees, with all the types written down, and uh, we want to know it's correct. The, the natural question is, how far can we go with types? So how, how much information can we put in the type system, right? So the usual trade-off is to make my types more complex and more complex and more informative and asking the compiler, or the programmer if the compiler is not smart enough, to check the things at, at compile time. And uh, is there a limit to this? How much information can I put in the types? Uh, there, are, there is a ton of Literature, of course, on type system, way too much to, to, to be able to give a, a decent overview in a talk. Uh, and there are many hierarchies uh, about type system. One that is that I chose because, uh, well, because it's nice, because it's a cube, and uh, because it's relevant for what Francesco is going to talk about, is what is called the lambda cube. So, uh, if you know, if you if you're not into programming languages, uh, you you have to know that programming language people like to do type system just as the lambda calculus at first because it's nice, it's small, it works, and the, it's it's good enough to be to give solid foundations to then generalize it to to bigger uh, real world uh, languages. Uh, so when they started doing uh, working on the lambda calculus. Uh, the easiest thing you can do with the lambda calculus is uh, the simply type lambda calculus. And this corresponds pretty much to having your base types in your languages, integers, booleans, characters, and things like that, and functions between them. So this is something you can also do in, the, in every language, like the example I showed before. This is a function that takes a string, an integer, and returns uh, an integer. So if these are your basic types, in this system, you would say that the function do cool stuff, takes a string, takes an integer, and gives an integer. And that's it. Pretty much uh, this is the only thing you can do in uh, this system. It's a, solid, it's a nice foundation. Uh, it's interesting. But it's pretty limited, right? Uh, after, after not so long that uh, you use these, uh, you write function and functions and you write types, you will find out that you want something more. For instance, uh, you wrote the same function for different types many times, but the code is always the same. And so you will end up using polymorphism. In, uh, in this case, uh, the exact name is parametric polymorphism. What this means is just generics, generic function, to be precise. So this is what you have in Java, C Sharp, C++, more or less, but it's weird. Um, these are functions that depend on a type. So you don't, for instance, uh, suppose you want to write a function that takes a list and gives you the length. Uh, in, the, in the previous system, you would have to write a function for list of integers, a function for list of booleans, uh, and things like that. This is boring and it doesn't scale, it doesn't work. So you, you find out about generics. And you write your function parametrics with respect to some type, not only to the input. And uh, your, your your types are a bit more complex now because there are quantifiers. So usually it's written in some formats like this. Uh, the, the type of the length function is uh, for every type t, you give me a list and I give you an integer. And this works for, uh, for all this of any kind of object. Parametric, for parametric polymorphism uh, has been extended uh, in many ways. Uh, I better not talk about all of them now, but uh, for instance, if you know Java, you know that uh, you, you have wildcards, so you can say, give me a list of something that extends apples, so you accept a list of green apple. 
Uh, if you use C sharp, you could say, yeah, it's generic, but I want this type to have a constructor with empty parameters and stuff like that. Uh, we'll skip about this part because it's too much. But uh, so yes, so this is the base of uh, all the kind of uh, generic functions you find you have in uh, in mainstream uh, languages. Another direction uh, in uh, which you can extend the most uh, basic uh, uh, type system is by adding type operators. So previously we said uh, we have some basic types, integers, booleans, and so on, and we have functions between them, and that's it. Uh, but it's also useful to be able to create new types in the program. So this is Haskell. Um, for instance, you need to write uh, code about uh, binary trees. And uh, what, what you say is that a tree of elements of type A is either a leaf, because it's the, the bottom of the tree, or it's an internal node with a label, and the left and the right subtree of, uh, of elements of the same type. And this is something you could not do in the other system because you are creating a, a new type based on existing ones in the program. And from this you can, uh, you can create your trees of, uh, of any types, of any type. And uh, in this case, the I'm abusing notation, I'm actually coming up with notation. Uh, you could say that the string tree is a tree of string. So the types are a bit more complex. There are type operators that we introduced in the type system from our program. And um, now the, the compiler's job is it's a bit more complex because uh, it has to, to check that these things we, we wrote here make sense. Uh, so at some point, uh, the, the compiler will ask itself, uh, what is the type of this operator tree? What, what, what is a tree? And uh, in, in this kind of system, uh, it's actually done in uh, real languages like Haskell. For how much free can Haskell be? Uh, you have something that is called kind. So it's kind of types of types. Of types. So you say that string is a very simple time. It's one of our base types. And uh, you call it star, and it's the simplest type of the hierarchy. And then you say the tree is something that takes a simple types, type and gives you a simple types. What this means is that tree is something that uh, takes a string and gives you a tree of strings. Or you give it an integer and it gives you a tree of integers. And it, uh, it allows you to write uh, very abstract and uh, and generic code and reusable. Haskell is a, it's a good example of this, uh, but uh, I won't do an example of this because it requires some functional programming knowledge. And so these are two possible directions in which you can extend your, your type system. Now, in this direction, you made functions depending on some type. In this other, you made types depending on some other types like this tree that depends on the types of uh, its elements. The other natural direction, well, natural, possibly, it's, uh, it's dependent type. So you want to make your types depending on some value. What this means is that uh, you don't just have a list of integers, but you can say you can have a type for the list of two integers and a different type for the list of three integers, and so on. So, Types can depend on values. Um, why, would, why would you do that? This allows you to encode in the type system pretty complex uh, precondition and properties of, uh, of your functions. For instance, suppose you have a, a vector of one string and another vector of three integers. Now when you ask for the type of this thing, you, you would say that the type of this is a vector of one string, not two, not three. And uh, the other type is vector of three integers. This is useful because you can now use this in functions. So for instance, if you have a function that concatenates two vectors, before you would say, I take a vector of elements of type t, another vector of elements of type t, and I give you an element, a vector of elements of type t. 
but uh, the, the type checker, the compiler, could not enforce the result to be of the right length. Now I can say statically in the compiler that my functions take a vector of, oh, I flipped uh, the arguments. Sorry, I brought the number before here, uh, after here. Yeah, I can say that the, the function takes a vector of elements of type t of length n, a vector of elements of type t of length m, and the result is a vector of elements of type t and length m plus n. What this means is that uh, statically with the compilers and with our type system, I'm avoid, avoiding a whole class of bugs. Like uh, if my function forgets one element, this does not compile anymore. Of course, this, uh, there are still bugs that are possible, like if you, if you reverse the order, but this is uh, definitely a, a, a stronger guarantee that you have from, uh, from the compiler. Uh, now, what about this cube? Uh, so, we saw how, how it is extended in, three, in these uh, three, let's say, orthogonal axes, because three, these three extensions are independent from uh, one another. Uh, the, the next natural thing to do is combine them, right? So, why shouldn't I be able to write uh, polymorphic function and dependent types? And I obtain a system that is called uh, lambda P2, P2 in the cube. Then I can combine this guy with this guy and get uh, this system, which I think is called system F omega. And, and then I can do the other combination. What is missing is uh, the, the last vertex. I can combine all these uh, three extensions of the basic type system in one. And the system I get is called uh, the calculus of construction. It's a very expressive type system. And uh, this is the basis of, uh, uh, of a class of programming languages and tools, let's say, uh, that are called uh, interactive theorem provers or proof assistants. And in this system, uh, you can freely mix values and types. Uh, you can have functions that take types, certain types, and do weird manipulation. And uh, this is a uh, this is useful because in this language, uh, as Francesco will show you, there is a very strict connection between uh, programs and uh, logic. But this is the topic of this talk. And this is the basis for a dependent type system like uh, Agda, uh, Koch, uh, things like that. I will, we will show you an example later. Of course, there are uh, a, a whole lot of things I completely ignore because uh, Either they didn't fit uh, the cube, or uh, because uh, they are less relevant for uh, for the whole talk and uh, for the part uh, that Francesco is going to talk about, the logic part. But it's uh, I have to mention them. So uh, there are a lot of type systems that, that are not in the cube. There are set theoretic types, so intersection type, union types, complement types, or there are more behavioral type system in which you use the type to describe uh, how the objects behave. For instance, type system that uh, allows you to ensure properties uh, about multi-threading, about uh, concurrent programming. There is optional and gradual typing. So you, for instance, for JavaScript, uh, there, is, there, are tools, there is a tool called TypeScript that allows you to add types in JavaScript, but not necessarily everywhere, only in the parts of the program that you want to type. This is called optional typing. There is type inference, uh, as uh, Jenny mentioned, uh, that uh, can make uh, the, the transition from the types to, from not having types to having types much smoother. Uh, type, C, type inference is the ability of a compiler to uh, guess, let's say, the type. So you don't write types, but types are there. The compiler writes them for you. Uh, the more expressive, the more complex your type system becomes, uh, the less the compiler is able to do this. It actually becomes undecidable pretty quickly. Uh, and there is, a, there is a, this, all these sort of decidability issues. And uh, in, the, in the system I mentioned before, based on full dependent types, you usually write types, but you really have to help the compiler uh, check that they are correct. So you write the proofs that your function is correct. What the compiler does is check whether your steps are correct. 
And uh, I think that's so all for, uh, for my part. I uh, will, uh, if you have any question now, otherwise I leave the rest of the talk to Francesco. Would there a personal comment? Uh, Joe West was been working quite a lot on type system, in particular intersection types. He was saying that after all, there is quite a close relation between uh, types and program analysis. So somehow there are different ways of looking at, at the same thing. And uh, after all, with program analysis, you, you acquire some information, for example, what, that you can use to produce uh, code, compiled code that can use that information in a way that things like Python uh -huh. cannot use, right? Yeah, I, I didn't know yeah. about that line of work. Interesting. Of course, there are people like Kuzo that do program analysis with completely different tools, but uh, yeah, yeah. somehow the, the two things are not so far <laughs> away. Yeah, well, that's nice because for those kind of type system, it's not easy to, to see the connection with logic because they don't play very well with logic connectors. And so. if I was thinking about Python, actually, you, you have some uh, uh, editors like uh, Spider that does some program analysis because it marks you whether you are using some variables that is not defined or uh, you have declared a variable and you don't use it, so that's... Uh, yes, yes, there are those, I saw that kind of tools in the case of JavaScript, and uh, <laughs> the, the problem I saw with the tools is that they have a really hard time scaling to big programs, because the, all the possible paths explode uh, easily, so, but, yes. said, uh, I will give you essentially nothing more than an idea of the connection that uh, there is between types and logic. And But I would like to start from an example or a possible use case. Uh, so a typical practice in when we define functions and to guarantee in some sense <laughs> the correctness of, of the function is to define preconditions on functions. And so preconditions are uh, formulas, predicates on the input of the functions. And the intuitive meaning is that the, if the precondition holds, then the invocation of the function would be correct. And <clears throat> so for instance, if we have this function which access a list of integers in position n, um, <clears throat> we, we define the precondition that n should be less than the length of the list, otherwise something weird to the happens. So, <clears throat> uh, so if the if the precondition holds, uh, we are guaranteed that the function invocation will be correct. If the precondition does not hold, we, we don't know what happens. In, in the best case, we will get an exception. In the worst case, uh, <laughs> like C or something, a language like that, that one, uh, we can even access memory without knowing what will happen. Uh, so what's the point with the precondition? Uh, they are informal, so they are usually written in the, in the documentation, so programmers ignore them usually. And, <coughs> and in the best case, they are checked at runtime. So uh, <coughs> there is no static guarantee that the preconditions are respected, and so we are not guaranteed that our function invocations are correct. So a, a natural question is, can we do something more. So can we statically guarantee that precondition holds? And better, can we use types to do this to, the, to this work? So the, <coughs> since preconditions are logical formulas, uh, <coughs> we need to understand a little bit the connection between types and logic to, to answer this question. Uh, <coughs> so let's start from a very, very super basic case. So we have this logical connective, which is application, uh, which is the most famous one, I can say. 
<laughs> since it uh, represents if then rule. So if A holds, then B holds. So it's something that says that it, it is enough that I know A to know also B. And how can we use implications? So implications are used in this way. So if I know an implication and I know A, then I know also B. So to prove B, it is enough that I prove that A implies B and then and prove that and prove A, and then I get the proof of B. Uh, <clears throat> okay, but more interesting is how can we prove implications? So I, how can we generate implications? And to generate an implication, we have to assume A and prove B. And this gives us a proof of A implies B. In a sense, we have to show a, a, we have to show a way to transform A, uh, the truth of A, into the truth of B, in a sense. Um, to transform a proof of A into a proof of B. And, and this gives us a proof of A by B. Uh, so, since we are talking about uh, transformations of things, dealing with implications, uh, and in programming languages, what, do with what, what does transformations are functions, let's look a little bit more into what are functions. Uh, so functions are transformations. So a function of type A, R or B is a transformation of object of type B, A into object of type B. And <clears throat> we use functions by application. So if I have a function F of type A, R or B and I apply it to an object of type A, I, I get an object of type B. Uh, super natural. Uh, and, but how can we define functions? So <clears throat> this is a strange syntax, but it's, it's a kind of lambda functions. They are in all programming languages, Python, JavaScript, uh, Java, Haskell, whatever you want. And <clears throat> how can we type this? I can, uh, which is the type of this? So uh, in the body, which is a, 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 an expression, we have a variable x, which is, assumed, which is assumed to have type A, and can be used anywhere in the body. And since we want this function to have the type A, R, or B, we want the body to produce something of type B. Okay? And it can, the body can freely use the variable x anywhere. Uh, <clears throat> so in a sense, this transforms the variable x into something of type B. And <clears throat> Okay, in a bit more formal way, these are the rules for typing, uh, for typing functions. And do you notice any similarity? Let's go on a bit. There's something similar. <laughs> they are exactly the same rules, in a sense. If you erase programs and variables from rules on the right, you get exactly the rules on the left. And the rules on the left are the rules to, for dealing with implications, and the rules on the right are those for typing functions. So, <clears throat> in a sense, there is this deep connection between functions and implications. So, a proof of implication is a, a transformation of a proof of A into a proof of B, and a, functions, a function is a transformation of object of type A into object of type B. So, this suggests that functions can be seen as proofs of implications. And function types are implications, in a sense. So this is a first connection between types and logic. So we have, we have some types which represent some logical formula, which is a step in the direction we, we want. So let's see some examples. So this is a super simple implication, A by A. How can we prove it? We assume A, we have to prove A, and this holds by hypothesis. So it's a super stupid proof. In a sense, it's a, an identity proof because we have already a proof of A and we have to produce a proof of A. And the function which uh, does this is the identity function. So we have a function, we take the variables and return the value. This is a proof of that implication in the sense of what I said before. Uh, Another example, A imply B imply A. Uh, how can we prove it? We assume A, we assume B, and we have to prove A. 
but A is an hypothesis, so we already have the proof. And the function is that function. So we have the variable x, the variable y, and we return the variable x, the first one. It, it, it is a projection, in a sense. OK? Uh, is it clear or not? Okay. Uh, <coughs> the last one, a bit more complex. So we have A imply D imply C, a first implication. This imply A imply B and imply A imply C. So to, to prove this, we, we have three hypotheses now. We have the first implication, the second implication, and A, and we have to produce a proof of C. So applying the second implication to A, we get a proof of B. Okay. Now applying the first one to A, we get an implication B imply C, but we already have a proof of B. And so we can apply it again and get the proof of C. So the function is this one. So we have a function f, a function g, and an element x of type a. We apply f to x, and we get a function from b to c. Uh, <clears throat> and this function is applied to g applied to x. g applied to x produces something of type b. The function f of x is from b to c, so this types and that's type c. Okay, so these are only stupid examples, in a sense, of uh, proposing implication of logic, so a logic which has only implications. And <clears throat> but this shows that we can write non-trivial non proofs using programs. And indeed, there, this is a, a, a more general paradigm called the Carrier Correspondence, which is based on three statements, essentially. Uh, this correspondence is a correspondence between logic and, and types, and, and the idea is that to, is to see propositions, formulas as types. So our statements are encoded inside types to see programs as proofs and uh, normalization as computation. But I will not talk about this because it, it is less interesting for this talk. And <clears throat> Okay, so the idea is that I write a formula, which is a type, and if I can write a, a program of that type, I have proved that formula. Uh, more generally, if I have um, if I have hypothesis, I have uh, so I have a type A, I have this hypothesis B1, Bn. If I write a program P of type A, which uses variables of type B1, Bn. I have a proof that under hypothesis B1, Bn, A holds. But anyway, what is the advantage of this? Uh, the advantage is that if we know types and we know the program, there is an algorithm that can check that types are correct. In a sense, we can check that the proof we have written is correct. And this is something that usually when one writes proof on a piece of paper, you cannot do. And so uh, we have stronger, we have guarantees that our proofs are correct, and this is this is really important. So uh, let's see uh, some very quickly. I talk about implications and functions, but this connection can be uh, extended to all connectives, propositional connectives, uh, conjunctions, and product types. So uh, to see con to prove the conjunctions. A and B, I have to prove A and I have to prove B. And a product type can be constructed by a term of type A, a and a term, of, a term of type B by pairing. And then we can use projection to get from a proof of conjunction, from a proof of a conjunction, the two elements. So to deconstruct the, the conjunction. These junctions are some types, and we have injections and case analysis to to introduce and eliminate these junctions. And then we have also constants, so the the, un, the true, truth, and the false. Uh, what is interesting is that the false has no constructor. So there is no way to introduce false, which is nice, because otherwise the logic would be inconsistent. If we can prove false, we can prove that in anything. So it's, it's not so, it, it's, 
it's nice that we have no constructor, no way to introduce those. Uh, but anyway, this is to simply to say that using types we can encode logical connectives, propositional logical connectives, uh, and so we can write non-trivial formulas. But coming back to the starting example, uh, to write the condition we need predicates. So we need predicate logic, and this is not enough because we only have conjunctions and implications and connects, but we cannot write predicates. So um, <clears throat> predicates, what are? are the predicate symbol applied to terms. So to see this as a type, we need a type which depends on term. And Lucas said something about this. These are called dependent types, and, and which are exactly types which depend on terms. And so if we have a type system where we have dependent types, we can talk about predicate logic. A few examples are these, which are dependent types. So we have the types uh, which says that n is positive. We have the types which says that n is less than n. And we have the type which says that the person is a student. So these are all dependent types and are predicate in the logic, from logical point of view. And <coughs> So, but to use this kind of types, uh, we need a way to tell the system which are the predicates we want to deal with. And this is not so easy. There are several ways to do this. Uh, I will give you only an idea. Uh, the, the most common way is to use induction, so to define predicates and types, so using inductions. Um, and so using inductive types. Um, this is an in, a definition of an inductive type. So we are defining a type T, and to define T, we have to specify uh, these functions, C1, Cn, which are constructors. So th these are ways uh, in which we can construct elements of type T. So, if we apply the constructor C1 to an element of type, of type A1, we get an element of type T. So to, def <coughs> to define a, a uh, an element of type T, we have to apply these constructors. And OK, um, two examples. Natural numbers, the simplest inductive type you can think of. Uh, to def a natural number, what is? Zero, a constant or the successor applied to a natural number. So uh, essentially, uh, are numbers write, uh, written in a unary way, so are like the primitives which write uh, straight lines on, on stones to write natural numbers. So we start from zero and we apply the successor to, the, to zero and we get one, then we apply again the successor and we get two and so on and so forth. Uh, <coughs> On the right, there is a, a, an inductive dependent type, which is predicate. Um, <clears throat> so this definition is a bit more complicated. So we have to define when a natural number n is less than a natural number m. So we have two cases. If the first one is 0, then the second one can be any natural number greater than 0. And so we, the first constructor says that for any natural number n, or n, I don't remember, 0 is less than the successor of n. And the second is like an, an inductive step. So if we, if we know that n is less than n, if, and we apply the successor to both ends of, the, of, of this uh, operator, we, we get again an, uh, an element of type s of n less than s of n. Um, <coughs> OK, this, it, it's a, a bit complicated, I know, but uh, it's just to, to give you a, an idea of what you can do. So, it's, um, so last, uh, we need a way to, to use types, to use inductive types. And this can be done essentially by two uh, programming constructs, pattern matching and recursion. So pattern matching, uh, so inductive types uh, can be constructed only using constructors. And, and so to define something that uses an inductive types, it is enough to define it 
on all possible constructors. And so pattern matching does exactly this. So split your definition into cases, one for each constructor. And recursion is recursion. Any computer scientist must know what recursion is. Uh, <clears throat> So an example, we want to define the sum of two natural numbers. This can be done recursively. We apply pattern matching on the first argument. We have two cases, 0 and the successor. In the first case, we simply return the second argument, because 0 plus m is n. And if we have the successor of x plus m, we recursively call sum on n and m. And then we apply the successor to the result. This is the standard definition of the addition in uh, piano arithmetics. And this is another definition. Uh, this function is indeed a proof, as we said at the beginning. This, functions, this function proves that for all n, n is less than the successor of n, so which is a quite obvious formula, but that can be proved using types. Uh, I will not say very much about this uh, definition because Luca will show you a demo in after this. I'm but running away and just closing the door. Uh, okay. <laughs> and but essentially is a proof that is done by induction, and the induction is represented by the recursive call in the second case. So the recursive call. Of, this, of the function f uh, simulate the inductive uh, hypothesis. Uh, OK, so no, that's, this is almost all. But let's come back to the beginning. So we have our preconditions. We have discovered a way to encode uh, logic inside the types. And so can we use this for precondition? Um, so the point is that the precondition is a formula on the variables, and so it is a dependent type. And so to, we can redefine the function adding an extra parameter, which has the type of the precondition, because the precondition is a type at this point. And so when we invoke, to invoke this function, now we have to pass a term which has type phi x1 xn, which is a proof of the fact that the precondition holds. So we are statically guaranteed that when we invoke the function, the precondition holds. And so we are statically guaranteed that the invocation is correct. Because to invoke the function, we have to produce a proof that the precondition holds. And this is uh, the, the same thing on, on the example. So we, we add the dependent type that the that n should be less than the length of that. So uh, we can use dependent types to force precondition. Uh, so that's it. Now Luca will show you a demo of how these things, since these things exist and are not the only theory, uh, uh, Luca will show you a short demo of using Don't worry, it's, it will be super fast. I know <laughs> we talked a lot. So. Oh, damn. Wait. Why do I always use the dark team? It never works. How small it is? I have no idea. I have no idea how to zoom. I tried, but it didn't work. <laughs> okay, maybe I can do one more step. Okay, so uh, this uh, this editor is an editor for the Coq language, which is a dependently typed language, and. Uh, you can see, it as, uh, as Francesco was saying, you can see these uh, kind of systems in two lights. 
One is uh, dependently typed programming languages that allows you to write very precise types for your functions. And the other way to see them is as proof assistants. So rather than uh, writing a proof and proving them uh, on, with pencil and paper, you state the proof in this language. You, you state the theorem, you write down the proof, and the, the, the machinery checks that your steps are correct. So you can be sure that your proof is correct. Uh, so, for instance, uh, if you want to define an inductive type in this system, then it's pretty straightforward. We define numbers, uh, we say that they are a type, and uh, they are either zero or the successor of a given number. And this type checks, so it must be correct. Uh, then we have what, uh, what Francesco was uh, saying in uh, his... Uh, last but one slide, which is, uh, uh, which is a, 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 a proposition that, uh, that relates to numbers. So LT stands for uh, less than, and uh, we have that, we want to say that zero is less than the successor of n for any possible number m. And this is true because uh, any number plus one is greater than zero, if we are about natural numbers. The other thing we want to say is that this is an implication. So if n is less than m, then also n plus one is less than n plus one. This is written with successor, but it's the same. And this, this also works. So. Suppose we want to write down a very, a very stupid theorem that is, for any number, we know that that number is less than that very number plus one. So for all n of type num, n is less than the successor of n. One nice thing you have in this, uh, with this editor is that when you have to write a proof, uh, that it can graphically help you by showing what's left to prove on the right. So. I can go step by step, and the system is telling me that I have to prove that for all natural numbers, n is less than the successor of n. So what's the first thing I have to do? Uh, in logic, when you have a formula that you want to prove and it starts with a universal quantifier, you say, OK, let's assume that someone gave me this n. So what I now need to prove is that this n, which is of type number that came from somewhere, is less than the successor of n. Natural numbers are inductively defined, so the, of course the proof will go by induction. So the next step, we ask, uh, we ask the system to do induction on n. We do one more step, and now we have two proofs to do. Of course, this is always the case with proof by induction. You have the base case and the inductive case. So let's focus on the first. The first thing we have to prove is that zero is less than the successor of zero, which is one. This is uh, kind of uh, obvious, but of course in this system you have to state everything very formally. So if you, if you take a better look and, uh, at uh, this less than, how I define this, uh, let's say, relation, is uh, a proposition about two numbers. So given two numbers, this gives me a proposition about these two numbers. In this case, I want to know that about zero and the successor of zero. So let's take this, LT0, apply it to zero, and it will give me this term. So zero is less than the successor of zero. This gives me exactly what I want to prove, right? Because if I evaluate this inside this, I will get less than zero S of zero, which is exactly what I want to prove. So if I do one more step, the system tells me that this subproof is complete and there is still the other part of the proof. This one, as you can see, is slightly different, not only because the thing we have to prove is different, but because we have one more thing we can use, the inductive hypothesis, because we are doing a proof by induction. So in the inductive step, we have to prove something knowing already something else. In particular here, we have to prove that the successor of n is less than the successor of the successor of n, knowing this, knowing that n is, the, is less than the successor of n. So we can do 
something like we did before. We apply uh, this proposition, we apply what we know to this inductive hypothesis and see how it changed. So from knowing that n is less than n plus 1, we derive then n plus 1 is less than n plus 2. At this point, our inductive hypothesis is exactly the thing we're trying to prove. So we just say to apply it and it's done. So I know all the steps are complicated and the syntax is not the best in the world. This is just to show you that uh, this, this, kind of, uh, this kind of system can nicely help you uh, showing you all the steps in your proof. And uh, in the end, if it, type check, if it type checks, you know for sure that your proof is correct. So in a hypothetical paradise world, our proof would be in something like this. Uh, of course, mathematics didn't really work out like that because it's hard to work into in these systems and uh, uh, you really have to be constructive in this system. So not all of the mathematics fits very well in this, in this framework. Uh, sorry for the mathe mathematicians out there. This is very simplistic. Uh, yep, that's it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.